Hello, everybody. My name is Lucas. I'm the host for today's Start and Slam Talk. Today, we're receiving Professor Martin Adams, Director of the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Chile. He's also the principal investigator in the industrially sponsored Advanced Mining Technology Center. He got his bachelor's and PhD from the University of Oxford. He also worked at ETH Zurich and NTU in Singapore. His research work focuses on autonomous robot navigation, sensing, sensor data interpretation control, and SLAM, obviously. And he's also currently the chair of the robotics and automation chapter of Chile. So welcome, Professor. Okay, um, thanks very much, Lucas, for the very warm introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Nikhil and Rachel for inviting me um, to present my uh, SLAM work at this very prestigious Tartan SLAM series. It's a great honor to be here. Um, as you just heard, my name is Martin Adams. Um, so I'm part of the Department of Electrical Engineering and also part of a research center called the AMTC or Advanced Mining Technology Center at the Universidad de Chile here in Santiago, uh, Chile. Um, I'd like to spend the next 45 or 50 minutes or so talking about unifying the SLAM back and front ends with Bayesian and maximum likelihood based random finite sets. So um, some of the pictures that you can see here on this title slide show some of the applications that have been, um, that have taken place over the last 10 or 20 years using random finite sets. And I'll show some of those applications in some of my slides as well. So here you can see, for example, space debris tracking, um, trying to track space debris uh, and update the trajectories to avoid future collisions in space. Uh, of course, autonomous navigation and mapping uh, here within mining scenarios, um, tracking and even labeling the trajectories of people or workers at industrial sites for security measures, and even applications as diverse as identifying and tracking uh, different cells under a microscope. So I'd like to split the presentation up into the following four sections. So as I just kind of hinted, I'm gonna spend the first part just very briefly showing some of the applications of random finite sets that I've been involved with over the past um, 10 or 15 years. And then in part two, I'd like to hopefully try and sell you the idea as to why, at least I think random finite sets are a very useful tool um, and some motivation for providing new mapping and SLAM tools or concepts. In the third part of the talk, I'll concentrate more on the uh, SLAM problem itself, talk a little bit also about multi-target tracking. And in particular, I'll show some of the relationships that can be inferred between these more recent random finite set SLAM approaches and state-of-the-art, what we would call random vector based SLAM approaches. And also in that section, I'll, I'll compare some results that we can achieve using random finite sets compared with state-of-the-art um, random vector graph-based solutions or even some of the older Bayesian-based solutions. And finally, I'll conclude the work and talk a little bit about my opinions on future work in random finite sets based mapping and SLAM. So applications of random finite sets. Um, any of you that have been to Chile or maybe know anything about Chile will know that it's um, the largest producer of copper in the world. So its mining industry is very important, which is why we have this center called the Advanced Mining Technology Center. And here you can see the results of having been invited to create three-dimensional geometric maps of a section of one of their mines called the Esmeralda mine. And to do this, we're using a three-dimensional laser range finder. And the challenge here was to really stitch together and render, if you like, um, scans just taken from 45 individual locations um, using point cloud data and actually registering that data within a SLAM framework to take into account uncertain vehicle motion between the scans and then to be able to build a consistent three-dimensional map. Um, the reason we used random finite sets for this is because each point cloud contains what we call several false alarms. That means points that seem to be detected that don't really exist and misdetections, things that should be detected which aren't. And as I'm gonna try and introduce during this talk, random finite set approaches are able to us to take into account detection as well as spatial errors um, in a joint manner. 
Here you can see some of the results of stitching together those 45 individual scans shown as different colors here in the, in the bottom section um, into a consistent map um, of the mind. This is another one from a, a different perspective. Um, a very different application that I've also been involved with, with various projects sponsored by the uh, US Air Force is the, what we call space situational awareness, or the, um, that's the posh name for it, or the real thing we're trying to do is to update um, catalogs of where, or the trajectories of defunct or broken satellites that are still in orbit around the Earth. Any of you that have seen the movie Gravity will probably realize that this space debris is going at enormous speeds, sometimes small pieces going at about 15 to 20 times the speed of a bullet, so any impending collision could, of course, be catastrophic. And at the moment, the US Air Force, as well as the uh, European Space Agency uh, and NASA are trying to update catalogs known as the two-line elements, which are publicly available catalogs for many of the satellites, um, trying to update the trajectories of this space debris, even though it's actually slowly moving off course since um, those pieces are no longer under control. What you can see here is um, uh, the result of a radar scan taken from the south of the UK um, uh, over Western Europe. And you can probably quite clearly make out there is a single defunct satellite moving through the field of view of the radar on the right here. Uh, but you'll also notice many false alarms. Those are the white dots dotted all over the field of view uh, of the radar. And even parts of the trajectory which appear to be missing, which constitute, if you like, missed detections. So the challenge, of course, in analyzing data like this would be to track multiple targets. Uh, here in this example, you can just see one, but multiple targets based on this very noisy data. And the noisy data has both detection uncertainty, which is the main effect you see here, as well as um, spatial uncertainty as well. So being able to deal with false alarms and missed detections in a joint manner, um, it again, allows us uh, or is a motivation for using random finite sets to try to solve this kind of uh, problem. Here you can see um, some results, just a very short video, um, where we're actually initializing orbits based on a random finite set based particle filter. Um, the initial orbit determination is a critical issue here. And these, maybe I'll wind it forward a little bit, these correspond to trajectories of broken or defunct satellites as they're going around the world. And the challenge that we have here is that these gold stars represent the locations of telescopes at different places around the Earth. And we often get observations of this debris only for very short time periods, typically up to a minute. And then it's quite possible that that space debris is out of the field of view of any of the telescopes for up to hours. So uh, the challenge here is really being able to um, come up with good estimates or multi-target estimates um, of these things um, with very few observations. You can see, for example, particles spreading um, on the Lee space where we're actually we, we're defining manifolds as to how these satellites can move and then they get updated once we get observations. Um, a final application I just wanted to show you is that of um, people tracking. Um, this is using a labeled random finite set filter, where if you look carefully, you'll see these numbers appear above the blue squares. The blue squares represent trajectory estimates as people are moving and crossing paths. The red flashing dots correspond to instantaneous radar detections. And the, the nature of radar is that we often get missed detections, um, false alarms. I think the video's, ah, the video's still going, it's good. Um, and the challenge here is to be able to maintain those tracks even in the presence of this detection uncertainty. So this is actually fusing LIDAR or laser range and radar data together to estimate um, target tracks. And we also introduced contamination into this with one of these fog machines that you see at discos and things, um, which you can see, see corrupting the data. And the idea here is that the radar is then providing um, help within the sensor fusion algorithm to still maintain many of these tracks. It's by no means perfect. Sometimes the numbers change when tracks cross, which they shouldn't do. If it's working perfectly, it should maintain those numbers. Um, but you can see um, perhaps the idea of some target tracking research that we've done. 
Um, okay, so moving on to part two of the talk. So hopefully that gave you just a flavor of um, some of the applications that I've been involved with. And as I mentioned, there are many, many others from cell tracking, space situational awareness, uh, and multi-target tracking in general. Um, I'd like to just in this part, provide, go back to some basics and really provide some motivation as to why we think random finite sets are useful and particularly how they can be applied in SLAM and in robot mapping. Um, so here I'm going back to basics. I'm looking at a very simple um, two-dimensional mapping problem, if you like. And the reason for showing this set of slides is that I'd like to, um, I think it's very important to note that estimation, and SLAM is of course an estimation problem, has very little meaning without a clear concept of the estimation error. And what I'm gonna try and show here is that when we rigidly use random vectors to represent the map, um, we actually do run into some um, problems with the concept of estimation error. Imagine in the left-hand scenario here, we have these two true features. One is located at the origin, the, the green circle, and another green circle at coordinates one, one. So the ground truth map represented by M on the left here could be represented as 0, 0, 1, 1. And imagine now there is a mobile robot which is doing, uh, has a mapping algorithm on board. And imagine it's traveling along this green trajectory and it successfully detects the feature at 1, 1 first. So it's shown here in its map estimate, M hat has the first element or has the first coordinates as 1, 1. And then it successfully detects the second feature at zero, zero. So its estimate of the map is one, one and zero, zero. Now, surprisingly, from a strictly mathematical point of view, if we find the Euclidean error or the Euclidean distance between the map estimate m hat and m, it's not zero, even though this mapping algorithm has come up with a seemingly perfect estimate of the environment. It's successfully detected both features and it's got zero spatial error. In other words, it, it exactly located the feature at one, one and zero, zero. And yet the error between them is not zero. It's actually two if you calculate this. Well, of course you would turn around and say to me, well, yes, but we could do two things now. Maybe we could have some kind of an external data association algorithm, which tells this estimate that the first feature in fact, corresponds to the second one in the ground truth map. And we could then permute the vector, recalculate, and of course we would come up with zero error. Or even if we didn't have a data association algorithm, we could just simply permute um, the estimated vector, find all permutations of it, and then calculate the error between each permutation and the ground truth. And the minimum one of those would still of course be zero. But it's interesting to note that if you permute a vector and then compare it with another one, you are in fact mathematically comparing sets and not vectors. And that's one of the reasons why random sets um, can actually give us a better uh, notate, uh, notion of estimation error in this case. Let's have a look at this second example on the right here. Imagine exactly the same experiment, but now the robot for some reason failed to detect the second feature or the feature at the origin. So in this case, the map estimate is simply one, one. Again, if we now strictly uh, model our maps with random vectors, there is no mathematical way to actually compare these two since um, you cannot define any kind of Euclidean error because the cardinality of each of those vectors is different. Interestingly, if you look at set-based error metrics, um, they are valid for sets when the dimensionality is different. Examples include the Hausdorff distance, optimal mass transfer distance, and more recently, uh, optimal sub-pattern assignment metrics and cardinalized optimal linear associate assignment metrics, or OSPR and COLA. These are metrics which penalize um, sets when they have both detection as well as spatial errors. So they don't just consider um, vectors which have the same cardinality, but they allow us to actually compare sets with different cardinalities to um, correctly quantify mapping error. Let's have a little look in a little bit more detail at this problem too. Imagine I have a ground truth map, which is these three um, features here. So I'm talking about feature-based robotic mapping or feature-based SLAM at the moment. 
and we have a plan view. These are, this is the ground truth. And I have a mapping algorithm, which comes up with this estimate shown by the four black crosses. Now it's important to note, there are two types of uncertainty here. Um, it looks like to me and you that we could now run some kind of data association algorithm and maybe our algorithm would be clever enough to tell us, well, this cross very probably corresponds to this circle. So we can kind of match three of them. And the other one probably corresponds to a detection error. So it's important to note the types of uncertainty we have here are spatial in terms of these red lines connecting the crosses and the circles. And spatial errors can of course be measured in meters. And the other one is not a spatial error, but it's a detection error. We cannot measure that error in meters. So we have two different types of error taking place. Now, interestingly, I could now um, measure the lengths of these red lines. In other words, find the, the average Euclidean error between the associated features and the ground truth. And it would give me what we would think would be a meaningful um, mapping error. So if I were to find the average lengths of these red lines, it could quantify for me the mapping error. But interestingly, imagine instead that my mapping algorithm came out with this result. Okay, now this result, if you look carefully, if I go back, the result we just looked at with the four mapped features is a subset of the one I'm showing you now. If I apply exactly these same rules um, to this map, you will get exactly the same mapping error, despite the fact that from a purely intuitive point of view, this mapping algorithm is much worse because it's committed many um, detection errors or there are many false alarms in its estimated map. And so from this point of view, we see that strictly using random vectors and many of the methods we've used so far to quantify mapping error, we run into certain um, consistency problems. So let's have another look at um, random vector approaches to SLAM and again, try and see why random sets can help with this. Imagine we have, um, again, a very simplistic plan view of an environment with these map features M1, M2, all the way to M7. And imagine the robot passes along the red trajectory, then it might seem reasonable that it, um, its mapping algorithm first detects M1 followed by M2, et cetera. On the other hand, if the robot had followed the blue trajectory instead, then that mapping vector could be filled up in a different order. Maybe M4 gets detected first, followed by M3, followed by M2, et cetera. And the black trajectory would give yet another different vector representing the map. This is actually a little bit strange if you think about it because the map itself hasn't changed. The map is constant, only the trajectory of the robot has changed. So it seems that the estimated map vector, since when you use a vector, the order of the elements does actually matter, depends on the vehicle trajectory. Now, if I use a random set to represent the map, then a set is by definition represents all permutations of the vectors which you could use to kind of make it up. So a random finite set makes more sense since the order of the features should not and cannot really be significant um, when it comes to mapping algorithms. Again, a problem that we all know about is one of data association. In particular, the order in which I receive my measurements, so for example, Z1, doesn't necessarily correspond to the first element in my current estimated map M1. In fact, in this diagram, Z1 would appear to come from M7 and so on. So we need um, these external data association algorithms to first untangle, if you like, the relationship between the measurements and the map when we use vectors. And then only then can we start to use either Bayesian or maximum likelihood um, sparse graph based approaches to solve the SLAM problem. So current vector formulations require data association to take place prior to, well, in the old days, I guess it was Bayesian, now it would be more maximum likelihood or graph-based updates. And that's because features and measurements are rigidly ordered in these vector-valued map states. What we're gonna show is that the random finite set approach circumvents the need for external data association decisions. That comes at a computational cost, as we'll see, but we'll talk about how it can be done and the advantages that can, it can bring. Um, other reasons for using sets to represent, particularly the mapping part of SLAP. 
how do we actually integrate new map features? For example, imagine that my current um, map vector, if you like, my estimate at time k minus one contains three features, m1, m2, and m3. And as my robot moves, I suddenly get a detection, which I think is from a new feature. I'm gonna call it m4. How do I actually incorporate that into my map? Well, of course, when we write SLAM algorithms, the map isn't really represented as a vector. It's actually inside an array in the computer. And I can increase the size of arrays and um, add elements to it and so on quite easily. But from a strict mathematical point of view, there is no real mathematical operation to allow me to add an element onto a vector. It doesn't really mathematically uh, have a consistency. Whereas if I use random sets, then we can quite easily say that the um, new estimated set at time k is the union of a set of three elements with a fourth element. So we do have a mathematically clean way of writing that down. Similarly, how do I actually incorporate extra measurements or missing measurements um, within my uh, measurement model? Again, if we use random vectors, we run into a little bit of a, a problem because supposing my measurements consist of these five Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5 measurements here, and yet my current estimate of the world only has four features in it. How do I write an observation model or a measurement model which relates to these five measurements to only four features? Okay, that is again, not really defined very clearly with vectors. And we typically need heuristics to maybe knock out one of the uh, measurements so that I can do that. However, with random sets, we have a clean mathematical way of writing down that the measurement set at time k is the union of all measurements that I expected to get. So it's the union of a measurement set D, which, cause, which is a function of the location of the robot and my current estimate of the world. That can in fact itself be an empty set if for some reason the detection of M gets missed or it can be a singleton. And we would do that um, for all the features in my um, current expected map. But that's also in union with what we would call clutter measurements. In other words, these could be false alarms that I didn't expect to see. So that we would be able to quite easily relate five measurements to um, a state vector which contains four map features using this mathematical kind of operation. Okay, so hopefully I've provided a little bit of motivation as to at least why I think sets as opposed to vectors kind of make sense, particularly when we talk about the mapping component of SLAM. So it's easy to kind of say that, but the question now is how should we actually use random finite sets? And, and can we come up with mathematical, method, mathematical methods to use them in a precise manner to solve various probabilistic problems, such as, for example, SLAM? Again, I hope you forgive me, I'm gonna to get to SLAM in detail in a minute, but I'm gonna go back to some very basic problems because I think the basic problems show some of the issues that we have um, with state-of-the-art methods and how they can be solved with random finite set methods. Um, imagine I want to find uh, an MAP estimate, the maximum a posterior I estimate um, from a distribution. So that's a pretty simple one. It's the maximum value um, within the distribution. So I'm looking for this value here. And the question now is, am I able to find this estimate when there are both detection as well as state errors. So we saw in the examples that I gave, mapping uh, algorithms can make what we would call detection errors or even existence errors in that the map might include objects that didn't really exist. Uh, it could also miss objects and also it can contain state errors and state errors in SLAM usually correspond to spatial uh, errors. So even if it does correctly um, map a feature, it might get the position of that feature slightly wrong. Can we, generate a maximum a posterior estimate when both these sources of uncertainty exist? Well, here's the question again. Let's consider a very simple example, okay? So let's consider a map which has got at most one feature. So it's a pretty trivial problem. And we've got an algorithm, a mapping algorithm, which says to us, well, there's a 50% probability that there is a feature and 50% probability that there is no feature, therefore, if the feature is present, 
then the spatial uncertainty is represented by a spatial density uh, or uniform density, if you like, where the feature is equally likely to be in a one dimensional interval between zero and two meters. So you imagine we're doing a mapping algorithm on the X axis, like a train running along a rail, if you like, and we've got um, detect, we've got existence uncertainty. So it's only 50% sure that there's a feature or that there is an object. And if there is, we've got this spatial uncertainty as well. And finally, we're going to define the units of that one dimensional interval to be meters. So it's, it exists somewhere between zero and two meters. Interestingly, this very trivial problem you, is very difficult, or I don't even know how you would begin to model that with random vectors only. If we represented the map as a random vector, it is not at all clear how you could in, include both this detection and spatial uncertainty without maybe adding heuristics in some way to try and do it. Um, on the other hand, with a random finite set or a random set approach, we can model the problem precisely. Here's the problem again, and we can use something called a Bernoulli random finite set distribution, which precisely models both the detection and the spatial uncertainty parts of this problem. Um, so here you can see that we have a 50% chance that the map is empty. Uh, if the map is a single term, so it contains a single feature M, then because of the um, spatial density existing between zero and two meters, the remaining 0.5 probability that this exists gets spread between zero and two. So we have a density of 0.25 meters to the minus one, if you like, and it's zero otherwise. So this density precisely models this problem and it's a random finite set for newly density. But um, there is actually a problem, okay? And let's see what happens now if I try to find the MAP maximum a posterior estimate. Um, looking at this density, we can see that the um, maximum a posterior estimate of this would say that the most likely case is that there is no feature because 0 0.5 is simply higher than the other numbers. Okay, and so the maximum map posterior A says that this map is actually empty. But interestingly, what if I now change the units of um, distance in this problem from meters to kilometers? Okay, so in this case, the spatial probability density changes because I still have an existence probability of 0.5. So there's a 0.5 chance the map is empty. But because the object can now lie anywhere between zero and 0 0.002 um, kilometers, so if I change it to kilometers, then the spatial density now goes up to 250 here. So what we can see is that if I apply the MAP estimator now, naively in this sense, then the MAP estimate tells me that the largest number here is the 250, and it looks more likely that there is now a map feature that exists. So what we have is a bit of a a problem in that all I did is was to change the units of the problem. When we considered meters, the MAP estimate said there's no target. When we considered kilometers, the MAP estimate said there is a target. So what this actually says or shows is that it yields a mathematical paradigm because we're comparing actually a dimensionless quantity about the existence probability to a quantity with dimensions, which is the spatial uncertainty, when there is actually a feature present. Now, because of this, the, con the reason I've been showing you this is that it turns out that standard estimators, whether it's um, MAP estimators, um, Kalman filters, maximum likelihood estimation, they are actually not well defined in the presence of non-unity target existence probability. And that's why we actually really need new ones, or if you like, modifications on those to deal with both this detection and spatial uncertainty. And that is the reason for the birth of this whole um, area of research called finite set statistics. So finite set statistics are statistical methods, usually Bayesian based, or they can be maximum likelihood based, which allow us to do Bayes theorem or to apply maximum likelihood approaches with random sets as opposed to random vectors. Okay, so I've been talking a while on concepts. Uh, let's actually dive into this SLAM problem again. And let's, again, um, we're gonna go a little bit to basics, but then we're gonna look at some results. The idea here is to 
show some SLAM algorithms which run with random finite sets. Some of the older ones were Bayesian based and we'd compare them with Bayesian based SLAM approaches, which I know are not really used much anymore, but we also compare some with some of the um, sparse information matrix or graph based SLAM approaches um, that we have now. If you think about it, um, measurements should really be modeled as a set. Um, you can see an example here, um, these green circles, again, this shows a plan view of an environment in which a real scan was taken with a radar. The green circles show the ground truth location of trees and lampposts. And these red crosses correspond to detections made by a radar from a single scan. And the, at the origin here, you can see the location of the robot that was carrying that radar. Now, the scan on the right was taken just a few seconds after the one on the left, and nothing was changed in the environment. And here you can see the effects of detection as well as spatial uncertainty. In other words, in the first scan on the left, you see that the lampposts in the top right appear to have been missed altogether. They were failed to be detected although they appear to be detected, albeit with spatial errors, in the right-hand scan. Also, the false alarms that appear in the left-hand scan obviously change in the right-hand scan, and many of the features are correctly detected. So a correct way to model the results of a feature detector or the results of a scan is to actually use a random set. And here we can see the definition, if you like, of a random set of measurements. So an example could be, range and bearing values. So a random set contains vectors corresponding to range bearing detections, and the number of those detections itself is also a random variable. So not only are the range and the bearing random variables, it's a random vector being contained in there, but the number of them is a random variable as well. So at any instant in time, it's of course possible to um, not get any de features detected at all, in which case it's the empty set, maybe one feature is detected, and so on. Now, with standard SLAM algorithms, the map is represented as a random vector. We concatenate um, landmarks at time k into a random vector. And of course, what SLAM is trying to do is trying to come up with a, the best estimate of the joint distribution on the trajectory of the robot. If we're talking about the full SLAM problem and the locations of landmarks, which could be time varying or often considered static, given all the measurements, inputs, and importantly, the data associations we'd need to know between the map um, ordering and the um, received set of measurements. Okay, so it's based on assumed data associations. And um, without boring you with the maths, we all know that we can use um, Bayesian methods to do that. These are a little bit old now in SLAM. These go back to the extended Kalman filter. Um, fast slam from about 15 years ago. Much more recently and much better results now occur in the batch estimation, maximum likelihood approaches such as ISAM or using the G2O solver. But importantly, both concepts depend on this very important term, which is called the measurement likelihood uh, in here. So it's the likelihood of receiving a measurement conditioned on a particular trajectory of the vehicle, um, a particular map and given the data associations. Now, what if we instead were to try to model the map with a random set instead of using the fixed vector that we used in the previous example? Remember in the previous example, M was this um, Roman, Romanized M. Now we're using Mathcal M to represent a set. And the fundamental difference here now is that our set contains an unordered or a, a, it's a set of landmarks which don't have any particular order. And the number of those landmarks itself is also a random variable. That's why when we generate random finite set based SLAM algorithms, they're not only gonna estimate for us the location of map features and the trajectory of the robot, but they'll also estimate for us the number of map features um, based on all the measurements which have been recorded. So it opens up another dimension, if you like. This means, this would imply that in those Bayesian or maximum likelihood based algorithms, we would need a new measurement likelihood based on sets. So in other words, we'd need to know the likelihood of a measurement given a set and given the data association variables. 
But here we come up with a conundrum, which was first spotted by uh, Ronald Mahler, who, who developed many of the finite set statistics about 15, 20 years ago. This above likelihood implies a data association dependent state. In other words, it apply, implies there is some kind of order necessary in the measurements, which relates to the order within the map state. And as we know, sets do not have any ordering whatsoever. So Ronald Mahler realized that a way to come over or to overcome this problem is to average over all possible associations. So this is a potentially expensive maneuver. We'll talk about that later. But instead of dealing with a particular association dependent um, measurement likelihood, what if we could come up with a likelihood which is independent of data association decisions? And a way to do that is to consider every single association possibility between the elements of Z and the map element M and average over all those associations effectively marginalizing out the association um, um, variable. We can also, with that, introduce something that we call a probability of detection. So it's a slam state probability of detection, meaning what is the probability of detecting feature M given the location of the robot XK? Um, we can also consider the probability of measurements being clutter or being false alarms. And if you then use a random, or if you use a multi Bernoulli distribution to model the measurement likelihood, this is the real multi target measurement likelihood that you come up with, which looks like a bit of a nightmare, but is actually quite intuitive if you really read the text. So, what this actually considers is the spatial measurement likelihood for state measurement pairs under association theta. This is the standard measurement likelihood used in SLAM when we have external data association routines, um, or we have assumed data association and theta is given. But if we don't have that, then we can put this into a multi Bernoulli distribution, okay? And we can actually sum over all possible values of the association variable. This can be multiplied by the probabilities of detection for all associated state elements. In other words, for all values of the map or features in the map which are in the association set and multiplied by the probabilities of missed detection, which is one minus the probability of detection for all elements which are not associated and further multiplied by the likelihood of measurements uh, or of non-associated measurements being clutter. So this gives us a full measurement likelihood. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes when we look at some algorithms. Interestingly, we, um, we produced a paper a few years ago, it's the one at the bottom in IEEE Transactions and Signal Processing, which shows that the random finite set formulation based on this measurement likelihood I just showed you is actually completely equivalent to the vector-based one when the map size is deterministic. In other words, we use external rules, if you like, to decide how big our map should be. Data association is assumed. The probability of detection equals one for associated landmarks. So clearly if I go back here and substitute one in this second term in the summation for all the associated landmarks, it will disappear. And the probability of um, non-associated um, features is, is zero. I didn't write that. And also the probability of non-associated measurements being clutter equals one. And we actually showed in this article that if you make those assumptions, those quite restrictive assumptions on detection probabilities, you end up with the usual SLAM formulations. And you can even derive fast SLAM, EKS SLAM or graph-based SLAM solutions. So based on this random finite set association measurement likelihood, the important thing to say here is if I then choose to use Bayesian filtering or more recent batch estimation methods, then I end up with a measurement likelihood which is independent of any external data association decision. So it effectively is a very powerful concept which circumvents the need for external data association algorithms. Um, currently published random finite set solutions include the PhD filter, the probability hypothesis density filter, um, cardinalized PhD filter, um, multi Bernoulli filters, generalized label multi Bernoulli filters, and, and so on. I'm going to talk a little bit about those in a few minutes. I think this slide is a, a, perhaps a good summary of what I've been trying to say. Um, and that is, if you didn't really care much about the rest or didn't even follow the rest, um, what we see here with Bayesian estimation, and you can write down a similar thing for maximum likelihood estimation, 
is that if I model the state as a vector x, so it's boldface um, Roman style x here, then if I change the order of the elements in X, so if X is a map vector, if I change the order of those elements by considering different data associations, Bayes' theorem gives me different results. On the other hand, the concept behind random finite sets is that they are still Bayesian based or maximum likelihood based. All the estimators are based on those principal, principal concepts. But if I now write my state as a random set X, then the order of the elements in X has no significance at all. In other words, if I were to change the order of my map features in X, Bayes, so, Bayes solution will give me the same result. So that's a very important um, difference, if you like. So why then use random finite sets? Well, finite set statistics has allowed us to um, develop a set-based algebra. Um, implicit data association um, is included um, jointly within the random finite set estimation frameworks. And as I mentioned earlier, they allow a mathematically consistent definition for error metrics, particularly when it comes to quantifying the map in terms of spatial or detection errors. Um, if you look a little bit of the history of the random finite set solutions, one of the simplest solution was the probability hypothesis density filter. Um, we proposed a SLAM solution to that back in 2011, and there's still been work going on recently with that. Um, a different concept is called the labeled multi Bernoulli filter, which is a true tracking filter in that it actually labels um, features. In other words, if you look at the features uh, in your map at time k and the features in your map at time k plus one, they are all individually connected with unique labels. So it's a true multi-target tracking filter, if you like. And there's been interesting work in that direction. And the most recent work we've done, which we're in the process of publishing now, is something called a hybrid generalized labeled multi Bernoulli filter, which allows us to use the G2O or ISAM um, sol or GTSAM solvers um, within this random finite set framework. So let me show you, um, I'm at the results part now. So let me just show you some of the results we've received in the past where we've um, compared um, the PhD filter, which was probably going back about 10 years now to um, random variable, uh, sorry, random vector SLAM approaches such as um, fast SLAM in this case. And here you can see, uh, again, a, a trivial example. It's a plan view of um, a vehicle starting at the origin and it's moving along this green trajectory, which is the ground truth, and it's kind of moving out in this spiral shape. And the green circles correspond to the true locations of some features in that space. Now, we ran um, fast slam on this algorithm, and it came up with the red trajectory and the red dots for the estimated location of the features. So it's done very well in, in its estimate. And we also ran something called the Gaussian mixture, PhD slam filter. Um, which is shown in black, it, it lies underneath this trajectory actually, and the black crosses show the map produced there. So you can see in this scenario, both concepts performing pretty much equally well. In fact, the PhD filter did miss one estimate here. So it kind of got beaten, if you like, by the fast lamb approach slightly, but they're pretty much um, equivalent in this scenario. Now, an interesting um, result happens if we now add clutter or false alarms to this scenario. So imagine now we have a scenario where there could be low light levels. Um, we've published articles using PhD for visual based SLAM, in which case we get a lot of false alarms or missed detections or a scenario in which um, we're in a mine, for example, where there's lots of dust. So we get these um, detection uncertainty too. So what we can see here is that we've added actually three false alarms for every 10 by 10 meter square section of this environment. And we've superimposed them all throughout the entire trajectory of this vehicle. So the green trajectory is still the ground truth. The blue one in this case is the odometry uh, simulated so with random errors. And these blue points correspond to all the measurements. Some of them coming from the real objects, the green circles, and some of them being false alarms. Um, if we now look at the results, we start to see some very interesting differences. Um, the red trajectory is now the fast slam one based on the random vector approach, which we can see is diverging away from the ground truth green trajectory. Um, the 
black trajectory is the PhD filter uh, one, which is pretty close to it. And the reason you can see for these divergences, if you look at some of the features, such as the one at the top left here, notice that the green circle is accompanied by five feature estimates, according to FASLAM, because of all that clutter. So the FASLAM algorithm, its data association algorithm, or its map management algorithm, is initiating five different features for it, which have all been updated, and it thinks there are five features there, when in fact there's only one. So because of the joint nature of the SLAM problem, that has a detrimental effect on the trajectory of the vehicle. You can actually see that result here. This is um, uh, an error, if you like, that's often not shown with SLAM algorithms, and that is instead of choosing to um, show the error in the location of a particular feature or a subset of the features, why not actually plot the feature number, which has been estimated as a function of time or update index K? And because this is a simulation, we know that as the robot traverses this environment, there should be 28 features should eventually come into the field of view of the sensor. So at the beginning, maybe only one of the features is within the limited field of view. As it moves along the trajectory, the second one comes in. That's actually shown by the green line that you can see here. This is the theoretical number of features which have entered the field of view of the robot as it moves. And the black one shows the estimated number of features according to the PhD SLAM solver. Remember, random set methods estimate the number of targets or features in the map as well as their locations. The red line corresponds to the estimated number of features according to the fast SLAM algorithm and its accompanying data association methods. You can see it's grossly overestimating um, the number of features that are there. Um, also running that with radar data, here you can see um, some real results from um, uh, an environment back in Singapore where I used to work uh, about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, this is a, a road which actually continues in a low loop under these trees on the left. Um, we drove or remote controlled a vehicle carrying a millimeter wave radar to execute three loops around there. And on the right, you can see all the superimposed detections we got from the radar. And you can see there are a lot of useful information there. For example, the four coconut trees at the top, and there's another four at the bottom, um, are kind of visible if you look for them over here. There's a wall with a chain hanging, which it kind of comes into view here. There's the car parking spaces. But as well as that information, there's, of course, a lot of false alarms and missed detections. So being able to cope with data like this is an interesting challenge for the random set method. Now, this radar data that you can see on the right has been superimposed onto the ground truth trajectory of the vehicle. If instead I superimpose that same data onto the odometry, then this is actually what I have. So this, if you like, is the input to the SLAM algorithm. It's all of the feature detections and the odometry. And we would like our SLAM solver to be able to solve that. Well, if we apply various methods. Now, these are all Bayesian-based methods. I'm going to come to more up-to-date ones in a minute. Um, here you can see the result of running extended Kalman filter slam with the nearest neighbor. This is fast slam. Um, and again, you can see the divergence because of all that clutter. Whereas again, the random set method is able to make a much better or more consistent estimate of its map in terms of the number of features and the trajectory. Um, this is one I can't resist showing. Again, it's, it's an old data set, used to be used um, quite a lot in um, it's Victoria Park in Sydney. I'm sure you've heard of it. And this is a publicly available data set where they have laser scans and they correspond to, or there's a lot of um, detections from tree trunks. And people can run their own SLAM algorithms using that data. And what we see on the left is MH fast slam, actually, multi hypothesis fast slam running. And on the right, the PhD slam filter. Now, it turns out if you use the data given, both algorithms work pretty much equally well. So, what we did is we actually added clutter. We would throw in some extra false alarms and see which one breaks first, if you like. And it's interesting that once, um, if I fast forward these a little bit, uh, maybe let's fast forward it significantly. Uh, to here. Then there comes a point, uh, the GPS trajectory, by the way, is in red. There are some broken parts. Here's the section now where the fast slam has diverged due to incorrect 
data associations. And you'll see in a minute that the trajectory on the left will actually start to cross through the buildings, which was clearly not possible um, since it's actually diverged. Whereas the PhD SLAM still maintains um, its consistent estimate of the trajectory and the map. And although there is no ground truth for the map, um, the map that we get here is consistent with a lot of the published results um, that we've seen um, uh, with the Victoria data, part, data set. Um, just another very brief result here. This is taken in a park in Santiago um, where I work. Um, here you can see um, a robot being remote controlled in a, in a figure eight shape to kind of move around this environment of trees. And we've got a very primitive tree detector, if you like. The problem is, as well as trees being in the park, there are many dogs and joggers. And this naive detector often misclassifies those um, as being trees as well, uh, which can cause the um, SLAM algorithm to fail because it's um, basically using false alarms um, within this mapping framework. Again, if I forward this just a little bit, um, you can see, yeah, there comes a point here where the um, state-of-the-art random vector method diverges, but the PhD SLAM solution is able to still maintain its track and, and actually produce um, good estimates for the trajectory um, and the map as well. So this all looks very interesting. The results I've shown you are a bit old fashioned because we've looked very much at Bayesian based SLAM approaches. Now, obviously now everybody's using graph SLAM approaches um, using the sparsity of uh, uh, matrix methods of the information matrix, um, basically to be able to um, slow, solve SLAM in a batch estimation framework. So now recently we've actually adapted the random set method to be able to um, tackle the same kind of problem and maybe even include the G2O or ISAM solvers as part of their um, concept. So again, going back to the basics, we of course want this full SLAM posterior, which is the estimate of the trajectory and the map given the measurements and inputs. Um, the map set and the vector trajectory are highly correlated. We would like to represent the map as a set because of all the reasons I just said. And what that means is we actually need a mixed vector set or a hybrid distribution to represent that. So let's actually define a joint vector set object which contains the trajectory of the robot and the map. And we can define a Bernoulli distribution on those which is similar to the Bernoulli distribution I showed you earlier. In other words, we have a distribution which corresponds to uh, one minus R multiplied by a distribution on the trajectory. Now R is the existence probability of a map element. So if there is no map element, then the probability of that being the case is one minus R. And we have a distribution pi naught representing only the trajectory if the map is empty. We have a distribution representing the joint distribution on a single map element and the trajectory uh, if there's a feature and otherwise it's defined as zero. Now the concept here is to apply um, the generalized label multi-Bernoulli filter, which is the, one of the most recent multi-target tracking filters, um, to each Bernoulli component. So it's a multi-Bernoulli filter, so it considers multiple components and each component has a distinct map size and a distinct data association hypothesis throughout the entire trajectory. And the way, way a multi Bernoulli filter works is to generate weights as to which are the most likely um, trajectories and corresponding map. And we can still update the spatial distribution using more recent methods such as the G2O SLAM solver. Um, so this is a figure I don't think I need to spend much time on. Um, here you can see standard SLAM where we have inputs uh, causing the robot to move, uh, measurements, and then these features of the um, uh, hexagons that you, you can see here. And the idea is we want to solve this joint um, distribution, which now contains a set-based map. And importantly, what you can see here is the data associations are shown as these red lines. Now we can see that for any particular locations of the robot, there are different data association decisions which could be considered. For example, it could have been that M1 wasn't associated with any of the measurements at time K minus two, in which case there would be no red line. Here it's been associated. And the way this filter works is, is called a hybrid generalized labeled multi-Bernoulli filter. It considers components 
corresponding to data association hypothesis. So maybe initially at time k minus two, we have a data association hypothesis corresponding to red lines that you see here. In other words, M2 has been associated with the measurement Z k minus two, uh, Z2 and Z1 at time k minus two. And also it's been associated with the measurement at time k minus one. So this particular choice of association hypothesis is represented with these sets. And we then have a distribution on the joint trajectory and map according to that association hypothesis. We can also predict a new data association hypothesis, which will typically be exactly the same as that we had before, but we might want to predict what would be the associations over here at time k. In this drawing, we predicted that no measurements are associated. You can have a different prediction if you like. And the idea then is to use a Gibbs sampler on all the possible data association hypotheses to actually come up with weights for um, these joint um, trajectory and map distributions. So for example, here in the top diagram, you see we have a data association hypothesis CK0 corresponding to the associations in the first position at time K minus two, associations at time K minus one and associations at time K. Um, at the bottom here, we now consider an association history CK1 to be added to that corresponding to feature M4 now being associated with the measurements I got at time K, okay? Also now we can do another Gibbs update where we consider another association possibility where we will consider um, the feature M3 has now been associated with one of the readings. Notice at the bottom on the last slide, it wasn't associated. Now that's considered associated and so on. We can consider a different history. So we can consider different associations throughout the history. Now, obviously the first thing you're gonna say is that looks like a very expensive um, optimization method and, and in general it would be, but the nice thing with Gibbs sampling is there are some quite clever techniques you can apply to make this computationally tractable. So what you can see here on the left, <clears throat> and these are my last, last results. I realize I've been speaking a long time, I'm nearly finished. Um, <clears throat> on the left, you can see the results of running this filter. The important thing is that there are no external data association algorithms being used here at all. So data association is not given. Um, the ground truth trajectory is the trajectory. This is, by the way, from one of the G2O um, libraries. The ground truth corresponds to the trajectory estimated with given perfect data association. And on the right here, you can see the result of running the G2O solver with maximum likelihood data association. And you see that the um, odometry is shown in gray and the result is actually very good. Um, the reason both results are pretty good is because we're running this experiment with low motion noise um, but in terms of modeling the uh, motion of the vehicle. Interestingly, if we now start to increase that noise, and again, this is using another one of the G2O library um, SLAM solutions, you can see now on the left, because of the higher motion noise, uh, and it's, it's undergoing a data association decision, which is not that good at the moment, but you see the ability for this algorithm to propagate back through different association hypotheses and come up with a higher weighted track, which will in a minute adjust, uh, which is just done. So it's just adjusted um, that bad data association decision in order to come up with a better hypothesis on the um, estimated trajectory. Still not perfect. You can see here, there's, uh, uh, it's just corrected one um, down in the middle. I think at the end, there's, there's a little part of the trajectory not perfect, but doing a lot better than um, state-of-the-art G2O SLAM solution on the right, which, had, um, which was using maximum likelihood data association. Um, I think you can see at the end, there's a little part of the trajectory not perfect, but it shows promising results. Um, in terms of being able to run SLAM without external data association. So it's really combining, if you like, the front and the back ends into a single algorithm since there's no map management and no um, external data association. These just show the um, um, errors for the trajectory that they're a lot lower in the case of the um, uh, hybrid GLMB solution. This actually shows the um, mapping error measured using the OSPA metric, which penalizes not only spatial, but also 
detection errors in the map. And you see here that our proposed methods took four times longer, if you like, than um, state-of-the-art um, method because the nearest neighbor filters, of course, very fast, making um, single decisions. Um, however, it's still linear in terms of the number of measurements and is still able to be computationally tractable because of some quite clever techniques you can um, run within the Gibbs sampler um, to make the sampling process of previous associations um, efficient. So anyway, I apologize. I think I've spoken for a little bit long. Um, in general, my conclusions of this work are then that state-of-the-art methods, which typically um, estimate the map using a random vector, um, they usually rely on heuristic map management methods. Uh, they apply external measurement to feature track association methods, external to the Bayesian or maximum likelihood estimator, which also typically need computational approximations. If you try to run MH fast lamb, which is a multi-hypothesis approach, um, that would require approximations because it soon becomes intractable. Um, so they then apply principled concepts, um, such as factor graphs and so on, to a subset of the measurements um, of the estimated features and targets because of this um, data association and map management methods needing to kick out certain measure, method, um, measurements. I think the main fundamental advantages of state-of-the-art methods is that they apply principled concepts to all the measurements and estimated features. Of course, there are still computational approximations needed. Those are in the PhD filter, uh, multi Bernoulli filters, and so on. But the difference is we really obtain Bayesian or maximum likelihood state estimates based on all the received measurements, which also gives us an estimate of the size of the map. So I think um, I've spoken long enough. There are many things that can be um, continued with this work, um, probabilistic sensor modeling, other finite set statistical methods, and even talking about extended target tracking where we get, um, or filtering, where we get many measurements corresponding to single objects. There are many avenues for future research, I think, um, here. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and to acknowledge many of the staff and students that I've worked with. Um, this shows some of the C trials we did in Singapore. I didn't really get time to show results of that. This shows one of our radars in a vehicle here in Chile. And again, thank you for your time. And if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to try and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It was very good. Uh, yes, if anybody on the Zoom has any questions, I think there's one question. Okay, I'll ask it first. There's one question on our list, which is, uh, also a question I had is what about RFS applications to visual slam algorithms? Do you have any, or is anybody like working on that right now? Uh, yes, yeah, they have. There, there, there's been quite a few. Um, there's been quite a few that have applied the PhD filter um, together with org features. Um, there was a magazine, a robotics and automation magazine article. I think Daniel Clark was one of the authors of that. Um, we've actually produced one which is appearing in a conference next week. Um, it's called the ICAST conference, which uses the PhD filter um, with uh, RGBD camera, the Microsoft Connect camera. And again, comparisons are made with ISAM too, so to, to get um, a feeling of, of um, what can be done. Because again, there are many, um, if you run um, the algorithms where the detection of features is relatively easy and where the descriptor that um, allows you to do data association works well. The algorithms perform similarly. In fact, it's very difficult to beat state-of-the-art ISAM or G2O solver when data association works. The interesting um, results come up when light levels are low or when those features become a slightly more difficult to detect or when you start to get significant detection errors or association difficulties, then you start to see performance increase. So yeah, there's been quite a few papers on PhD SLAM with RGBD cameras and with normal cameras, yeah. Okay, so uh, next question, I guess, Professor Carlon, you can go ahead. Hi, Martin, this is, uh, this is Luca. So, so first of all, thanks for the great presentation. It was, was a fantastic overview and was, was super clear. So thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I have a question about the following. So, I think that recent SLAM algorithms are also going in the direction of trying to, to reason, not only on the state, but also over the data association. So you will see these recent papers doing factor graph optimization or just maximum likelihood estimation 
and including variables like you know corresponding to the data association and trying to find at the same time the best assignment of states and data association. Mm -hmm. So one way to think about it is that maybe you have uh, binary variables that you put in the in the optimization problem, which are modeling maybe the presence of outliers, or they are modeling like you know incorrect data association or even permutations of the of the features. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that setup um, is uh, is would address some of the issues that you mentioned, or uh, that fall this still falls fall short. And then I have another question about computation, but you know, let's start from the first one. Quite, quite possibly, yes. I mean, um, so of course it, it makes sense that the data association issue is still a big issue in my opinion. I know many people out there say slam is solved, but I think data association in many real scenarios is, is challenging. I would say. Um, Yes, it's possible to come up with better solutions by including those things in, in the factor graph. All I would say that we're doing here is really going back to the fundamentals and trying to include those things in a very principled manner. So by considering um, false alarms, uh, misdetections, um, also you can even consider things like the birth of features and the death of features was something I didn't talk about. This, the nice thing about the random set approach is it does actually offer you um, a very principled um, basis from which to then use Bayesian or maximum likelihood graph-based um, approaches to do it. So I would say, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, maybe it, it sounds a bit pompous, but it's almost like saying, well, here's a way to do the solution. I'm gonna look at the solution at the back of the book and here's another way to do it and I can get the same thing. I would argue that the use of random sets is a very principled way to start um, that problem off. I mean, there could be other ways to do it and get similar results by all means. But... And indeed, I would agree with, I would agree with your take. I, you know, what, what I believe is that uh, at the end of the day, there, there are going to be connections, probably like, you know, the binary variables that uh, I'm talking about will, will implement some set-based logic on your side. So like, you know, it'd be nice to, to see if indeed there is a deeper connection there. My second question is, is about uh, more computation, right? So yeah. the, the computational part, of course, there is some combinatorial nature of the problem, like, you know, floating around here. You can permute things and you can reason over permutations. Um, yeah. And, and uh, uh, you mentioned that there are approximations. What I was curious about is uh, how does the complexity, what, the, what are the factors impacting the complexity? Is the number of detections, the length of the trajectory? What is important there? Yeah. Maybe I can show you, um, I've, I've got some slides that I didn't show you, show here. Um, let me show you the simplest approximation or what we think is the simplest for a random finite set, which is the PhD filter. So- um, you, you, can, you can share your screen again. I, I, I took oh, it off for, to highlight you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, I think. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. So yes. um, the problem, the, the PhD filter, so, the reason for finite set statistics is that concepts such as integration and differentiation, which you need for marginalization and to define densities, are not, are not defined for sets. So finite set statistics allowed meaningful ways to kind of define those, if you like. So one is um, from point process theory, an idea is to actually represent a set with a function, and then you can apply that function in Bayes' theorem or, or maximum likelihood methods. So the approximation here is that we define a function whereby it has to obey two things. The integral of the function gives the estimated number of elements in the set. So if it's a map, you integrate the function, it should give you the number of map features. And the locations of the maxima of the function correspond to the estimated values of the set members. So here's an example. Supposing I've got um, a trivial set of two features uh, uh, on, in one dimension. So they've got uh, x equals one and x equals four. This would be a suitable intensity function. Uh, it could be a sum of two Gaussians. Um, the maxima of this function are approximately at one and four, which is what the elements are. And of course, if I integrate this function um, over the space x, it will give me two because it's the sum of the integrals of two Gaussians. Importantly, it's not um, a PDF because you integrate a PDF, you get one. So this is the um, first approximation used in the PhD filter where we can represent a map with a sum of Gaussians, um, but they're not really Gaussians, they're intensity functions because the mass inside those intensity functions also represents the number of features. So maybe you can see 
um, at the lower right in these graphs, this is a plan view on the left and a kind of a, a side view on the right. Um, you can see this Gaussian with the red peak um, is actually an intensity function. I keep saying Gaussian. And the intensity function, I should say, with the red peak um, has a mass of two, approximately two, because the filter knows that it's representing um, two features. So that's kind of one um, uh, uh, approximation made. If I go right back through my slides, I'm going to go back and I'm going to restart the screen again. The main computational issue is with the measurement likelihood that I think I showed you. So if I put this one back up. So as we said, the measurement likelihood used in state-of-the-art SLAM algorithms would be just the first term in the large brackets here. And that means, of course, if I'm given an association, then it's pretty easy to come up with a measurement likelihood and run state-of-the-art SLAM. Now, if you want to start becoming more general and really not assume any associations, then the correct way to really do that is to consider all possible associations, which soon becomes intractable, uh, as you're uh, implying. So that's the reason that there are very useful uh, methods such as Gibbs sampling. There's also loopy belief propagation, which we've used. Loopy belief propagation is very fast and actually allows us to come up with algorithms which perform almost as fast as state-of-the-art methods, but it's an approximation. Um, it, it can, there's not really a proof that it is um, it converges um, to the best association decision for all scenarios. So Gibbs sampling is a more principled method that has a proof of convergence. And there's all kinds of tricks you can do in Gibbs sampling too, in terms of simulated annealing and, and things like this. But the main expense in generalizing this to, um, you know, if you like really combine the front ends and the back ends to allow you to not have to do map management, not have to do external data association, is in the calculation of this likelihood that you see here. So I hope, I'm not sure if that answered your question. And, and I guess uh, you expect that kind of computation to increase with, uh, with what? With the size of the state space, with the number of associations? Like, you know, what, what is the factor there? Yeah, well, here it's with the number of associations, which of course increases very fast. But, but what you can do is that okay. the nice thing about the nice thing about a Gibbs sampler is um, a Gibbs sampler is basically a, a MCMC algorithm, a Monte Carlo, a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, and it allows you to um, generate samples from joint distributions which are conditioned on the current state. So you can make quite guided um, solutions to Gibbs sampling, which can speed things up. I mean, don't get me wrong, this will always be slower than having been given an association, of course. If somebody gives you an association or you have a decision, um, then this cannot possibly compete in terms of speed. But the problem is given an association, as we all know, is very fragile if it's the wrong one. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Professor Martin. Uh, the last question we always, I guess we always want to ask our, our, our guests is, do you have any specific uh, material or PDF or, or links Maybe you can send that to us or just talk in high level, right? And then we can post that to, to everybody that wants to learn more about this material, this, this topic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, the, the slides I'll certainly make available. There's, there's quite a few references to our work given in the slides. Um, actually, my website has most of the publications, I think all of the publications shown in these slides there, but I can, um, I can certainly send a link containing um, publications which go into a lot more details than this, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll post and that only, to everybody, to everybody yeah, that's, that's following us. Yeah, not only our publications, but other ones using random sets too, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So I guess this is it. A very nice talk. Very nice to have you. Hope you come back for future, ask questions for our future, future guests. So that would be nice. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Lucas. Thank you for your time.